morning, church. So this morning I will be reading from Acts chapter 6, reading from the ESV. And it reads as follows. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Thank you. We want to say that those who uh, look at the images and graphics that we do uh, put out, um, you would have seen that it highlights a text that starts from uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 8 to chapter 8, verse 3. But we're not going to get that far. And that is why Tanua didn't read that far. So don't be alarmed. We're not going to be here past 2 o'clock. <laughs> no, so we will be a little bit quicker than that. And that is why we chose a specific text to drive a specific point um, from the text. My name is Deseho, um, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City. And as an elder, I'm sent out with Reino to plant Fellowship City. And I have the privilege this morning in particular to share the word of God with you. Um, we are in season two of Acts. So we've just started season two. Uh, and last week, Reino spoke about the challenges of the church as seen in Acts 6 verses 1 to 7. And these are familiar or similar challenges that we would face as Fellowship City. Um, we need hands and feet and hearts as the ministry of God grows here at Fellowship City. And that is what um, the dis disciples at that point uh, brought seven people to serve more in the spaces of the church to continue the ministry. So if you missed that sermon, please listen to it on, on, on YouTube or your favorite audio podcast platform. Um, and also consider serving here uh, at Fellowship City. That is if you call Fellowship City home. So today we look at Acts 6 verse 8 to 15, not 8 to 3. We will look at Acts 7 as well because it's got some implications of the text that we're currently looking at. We will do so looking at three particular points. So our map or our flow for this morning will be the message, will be our response, and the gospel. So we'll look at the message, our response, and the gospel as we look at Acts 6 verse 8 to 15. Let me pray for us. Let me ask God through his Holy Spirit to be with us this morning as we engage this text and to help us understand this text and know what we ought to do as we respond to this text. Um, Lord, we thank you that this morning we can gather as your people, that we can come together, sing songs of praise and worship, that we can hear from you through your word. I pray that you speak through me. I pray that you would speak and touch the hearts of your people. Oh, I pray that you would speak to them those things that you'd want them to know, to say, and to do. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are introduced to Stephen, as Tandiwa read um, this morning. We were also introduced to Stephen in verse 5 of Acts 6, um, as the disciples brought on more people to carry on the ministry. They brought seven more people to help the ministry so that they can continue to grow this ministry. So that's where we were introduced to Stephen. And this morning we read a little bit more about Stephen. 
we aren't really told about his full personal life um, or his complete lineage or if he had family or we aren't really told about the length of time between when he was appointed and when this particular verse 8 to 15 um, was sort of put together. But what we do know and what we do see from this text is we see Stephen the man. We see Stephen and his courageous witness for the gospel. That is what we will sort of see as we engage this text. We see this because we read that he was performing wonders and signs among the people. Not only wonders, as it says, but it says great wonders that he was performing among the people. He was being noticed by those that were around him. And we see that specifically when we look at verse 9 of our text. So the people he was with, the people he was performing miracles around, started to dispute with him. They disputed what he was saying, and they disputed what he was doing. And these are people from the synagogue. These are people uh, which are from the freedmen synagogue, which is what they call it. Basically alluding to a people that were formerly slaves, Jews who were formerly slaves, but now form part of the synagogue that are free. Um, so he forms part of the synagogue, and he's teaching in the synagogue, and he sometimes performing signs and miracles and wonders that are called great. So these people that he's with, from different tribes we see, um, these people are the people that are disputing with him or have a dispute with him. And we see that Stephen responds to this dispute such that they cannot withstand the wisdom and spirit with which he is speaking. So can you imagine this picture? Stephen sitting or standing before these people and these people of different cultures that are now disputing this message, challenging him. But we are seeing that he does not back down. We are seeing that he, he, he could have buckled, he could have buckled, he could have backed down, but he doesn't do that. He continues. And he speaks with wisdom guided by the Spirit. That is what we see. So why do you think Stephen would respond like this? What is at the heart of this confidence that he has to stand among these people who are disputing him and for him to respond in this way? What's at the heart of this confidence? I think he has walked with the disciples and come to greater knowledge of God through the teaching and discipleship. I think it is because he's also full of grace and power which we see. So power here alluding to Acts, Acts, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, um, which says, um, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So that's the power that is re referring to here, that the Holy Spirit. So I think it's speaking about, um, or he gets his confidence from, from the disciples and the teaching, from the from the grace and power that is on him because of what God has done. But more importantly, I think his confidence is from the promises of God. I think he holds to those promises of God that he's heard through the teaching. And I think one in particular promise we, we can see in Luke chapter 21, 12 to 19, which should be behind me on the screen. And it reads, and this is Jesus foretelling about destruction and persecution that is coming. So verse 12 says, but before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and some of them, some of, some of you, will, they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair on your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. That's the promise that I think is at the heart of his confidence as well. The promise of what Jesus had already said, and knowing, knowing this truth, 
So Stephen isn't the only one that would experience this persecution. He's not the only one that would experience these challenges. Some of the disciples would have experienced it as well. And we, it's important to note here that even some have died because of these challenges. But he still holds firm and continues to share the gospel. I do think when Jesus here is saying um, that not a hair on your head will, be, will, will perish, I think he's still ultimately referring to if you continue in this way, live, living in this way, sharing the gospel, you will not lose your life, but you will gain it in eternal life. So by your endurance, you will gain your lives. So you may lose your life in so doing, but you will gain your life through your endurance. So verse 11 starts to escalate now. It starts with the word, then it reads, Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him blaspheme, sp- speaking blasphemous again, words against Moses and God. So, so the people from the different tribes, from the synagogue, can't challenge Stephen. And he speaks with wisdom and speaks through the Spirit of God. So they can't challenge him. So now they come up with another plan. They make another plan, a devious plan. They come up with a conspiracy. They spread lies. We see that in verse 11 about Stephen. So much so that he is arrested and seized and brought before the council. And this is the same council that Jesus stood before for the same charges as Jesus. Blasphemy against Moses and God. And those were the charges. They take a step further in this plot, they bring about false witnesses to strengthen their case. And just a side, just a short side road, um, blasphemy against Moses and God, that is what he's being accused for. I do, I want to split these two accusations and sort of deal with them one, one, one at a time. So the first one being that Stephen is blaspheming against Moses. So basically speaking uh, profanity or disrespectfully against Moses. And the second accusation is blasphemy against God. So the main exhibit to use in testing these cases, in testing these accusations, is really to, to look at the Bible. Let scripture interpret itself. So the first accusation about Moses. So Acts 7 shows clearly that Stephen honors Moses. So if you read Acts 7, this is Stephen's defense against these accusations. It shows that he honors Moses. This then contradicts the blasphemy against Moses and the law, like the people are saying, that like the false witnesses are bringing as a charge. Accusation number two is Stephen saying that Jesus will destroy the temple. And we see it from verse 13. This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. I think we need to spend a little bit more time on this point because of three reasons. The first reason, spoiler alert, Stephen dies for this. He dies for this very accusation. He is stoned in Acts 7, verse 54 to 60. The second reason, the Jewish leaders kill for this truth. Because this truth to them is threatening. This is not a truth that they want to believe. Jesus was also killed for this truth. He was also killed for the truth that he would destroy the temple and in three days it would rise again. And lastly, the the third reason is that Stephen defends himself against this this accusation. We see this throughout Acts chapter 7. So Acts chapter 7 is is actually the longest speech in the book of Acts. And that shows the importance of this defense. That's what Luke is trying to portray in this defense. That there was an importance in defending against this accusation by bringing this speech to the people that were accusing him. So when we look at John chapter 2 verse 19 and John chapter 10 verse 18, we come to understand whether Jesus did say this and what Stephen really meant 
when he spoke about destroying this temple and in three days that it would rise again. So in, in John chapter 2, verse 19, we see Jesus say, destroy this temple and in three days I will build it up. The context behind this is that Jesus is coming into the temple and he's cleansing the temple of people that are selling. He's overturning the tables. There's people that are exchanging currency as well. So he's saying that they should not do this in his father's house and that he will destroy, uh, destroy this temple and in three days build it up again. But they respond in saying it has taken... 46 years to build this temple. And then John further helps us out by pointing out that Jesus here was speaking about the temple of his body, not the physical temple that they are thinking about, which took 46 years to build. The temple is his body, which would be broken and in three days will rise again. That is what John is helping us to understand. And in John chapter 10, verse 18, we see Jesus say, I will destroy this temple. Here he is saying that he would give his life, not necessarily that the temple would be destroyed by their actions. It's important to understand that Jesus, what Jesus means in this destroying of the temple. So Jesus dies and the temple dies. And all the symbols of the temple die with him. And there's a couple of symbols that come with that. So Jesus becomes our one and only high priest. The high priest that would intercede for the people. That's one of the symbols that would be destroyed. Jesus becomes our one and only sacrifice. There would be sacrifices of sin at the temple that would happen periodically. But Jesus would destroy the symbol and he would be our one and only sacrifice. Jesus takes the symbol upon himself on the cross. Jesus made himself the mercy seat of the temple. His own blood, the blood of the covenant. The glory of God came down and rested on him and raised him from the dead. If you want to know more about the temple, the spirit, I encourage you to watch more and any sermon on the spirit of the temple in the series, I Am Who I Am. He speaks in great detail about the temple and the spirit. But these are the symbols that would be broken when Jesus dies and the temple dies. He would take these symbols upon himself. That is what the text is really saying. So I want to draw out a few observations from the text as we understand it, as we understand Stephen, as we understand the accusations made against him and the man who he is. So I want to make a few observations from the text. Stephen was known to possess wisdom. To understand what that means, we need to start at Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So wisdom comes from knowing God. To be full of wisdom, we must grow in our understanding of who Christ is, must grow in our understanding of the cross of Christ, where human pride is humbled and God's grace is exalted. Where human pride is humbled and God's grace is exalted. Wisdom comes from a Hebrew word meaning skill. It refers to right conduct in obedience to God's will. So remember, knowing God means you know his will. So it refers to right conduct in obedience to God's will. Not just understanding or knowing the Bible. It's the application of it and living in obedience of the Bible. So Stephen was one that was obedient to God's will and therefore knew God and was one who had wisdom. Wisdom was used four times in the book of Acts, twice for Stephen. And that speaks about the character of the man, the character of Stephen. And we see it in Acts 7 as well when he speaks And his speech and what he's speaking about is spoken of as wisdom. That's one observation. Another observation, Stephen is said to be full of grace. Similar is said of Jesus in John 1 verse 14. Jesus is the grace of God personified. Because grace 
his undeserved favor. And God shows us favor in the death of Jesus Christ for our sins when we deserve just punishment for those same sins. The phrase used for, for Stephen means he had personal understanding and experience of God's grace. And this was revealed through the cross. We know that salvation is not by our works or our own righteousness, but rather by the undeserved favor of God, shown to us while we were yet sinners. And it says that he was full of grace. So if you're full of something, it bubbles out of you. It comes out of you. It is a part of who you are. So Stephen was a man who showed much grace, who lived that grace. He was full of that grace. And we see it in Acts chapter 7. Instead of cursing his persecutor, Stephen prays, Lord, do not hold the sin against him. They're putting him to death. But he says, Lord, do not hold the sin against him. He's full of grace. He shows this grace. This grace overflows out of him. Another observation, full of the Holy Spirit. So the main evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is the visible manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit. So love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These qualities are not built overnight, but they're built over months and years as the Holy Spirit works in us. That Holy Spirit works in us, makes us more and more like Christ. It's important to note that being full of the Holy Spirit doesn't mean sinless perfection. No, no one is perfect except for Jesus Christ. Even the most godly believers will have areas of weakness and imperfection. But this means that the Holy Spirit is at work and the Holy Spirit continues to conform us to the likeness of Christ or conform Stephen as we come to understand who is more and more like Christ because of the work of Christ, because of the teaching of Christ and how that impacts his life. Godly character. So Stephen was one who had godly character. He was full of the Holy Spirit, full of grace, wisdom, faith, power. Power seen through the miracles he was performing through the Holy Spirit. This godly character is built over time. Spent walking with the Holy Spirit. This enables Stephen to be courageous in his witness. Witnessing to the gospel brings op opposition and persecution and he withstands this. He continues to share the gospel. And it has devastating effects as he loses his life in that way. However, what is important is that Stephen was was a first martyr, meaning someone who dies because of their religious beliefs. He believed in the promises of God to the point of death. He believed in what he was taught by the disciples. And he believed in the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. So even though he died, he gained his life through endurance of the gospel and his love of God. Christ-like. So Stephen was Christ-like. He knew Jesus as Lord and Savior. He knew Jesus as fulfillment of the law, for he knew the law and customs brought through Moses. He knows Jesus as the fulfillment of the law. Jesus as the one who destroys the temple, temple sacrifices, and some of the customs that bring access to God. Jesus is then our access to God. Not because of anything we have done, but because he is full of grace. Jesus is full of grace. In many ways in this section, we come to see that Stephen was more and more like Christ. He was accused in the same way Christ was accused. Stephen was killed after defending himself in Acts chapter 7. So what we see in Acts chapter 7 verses 54 to to 60 is that ultimately the crowd after hearing the truth that he has to share as he defends himself against his accusations that the crowd have ultimately hear this truth but ultimately do not respond in the manner that you would think the text says now when they heard these things they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him but he full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. 
But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he cried out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do do not hold this sin against him. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. There's so much in this text. We're going to just look at a few observations from the text. There's just so much in this text. We, We won't speak about Saul. Saul will come in next week's sermon. We see his first mention here as one of the people that were part of um, these people that were that were accusing Stephen and that were putting to him to death. We're seeing him as a ringleader as well. If you read the text and you'll see and hear more of that um, in the next episodes of Acts. So Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. He then saw the glory of God and Jesus. The one who intercedes for us, the high priest. So many times Jesus is mentioned in the Bible, sitting next to the Father, but now we see it's mentioned that he's standing. And I'd like to believe that this was a sign of honor, much like what you get when someone has acted with distinction. Much like you'd get when maybe a PhD student graduates, because of the discipline that would come from acting with distinction. Or maybe like uh, if those who know football, uh, 2005 Barcelona versus Real Madrid, um, there is a chap named Ronaldinho who uh, destroyed Madrid and the opposition stood up and gave him a standing ovation because of how he acted in that way. So what's most important to see is that Stephen says his last words to God, not the crowd that is stoning him. He says his last words to God as the crowd is crushing his skull. He says, Lord, do not hold the sin against him. False witnesses. This is the last observation. Luke mentions false witnesses. I think what Luke was actually saying here is that the, the false witnesses were putting a bad twist, were putting false twist to the truth. I'm saying this because Luke knows that C- Stephen said these things that Stephen said that Jesus would destroy the temple and some of the customs of Moses. Luke knows this. The false part is that he did not blaspheme against the law, Moses and God. That's the false twist that these false witnesses are putting. So Stephen didn't speak against the holy place and the law. What is important to note is that the false witnesses did not understand that the destruction that Stephen and Jesus spoke about was as a fulfillment of everything that God and Moses promised, which is the forgiveness of sins and personal access to God through the change in the priesthood, which would now be through Jesus Christ. The false witnesses didn't understand this. Our response. There would be a couple of different people who might respond in different ways to this message, respond in different ways to Stephen, respond in different ways to understanding what this section of text has to say to us. And I think there's some responses that might be in some of these ways. Maybe fear of sharing the gospel. We see Stephen is ready to share the gospel. He's ready to witness. It also seems that he has a lot of knowledge about the Bible, a lot of knowledge about about Jesus. So much so that he would respond to many who accuse or dispute with him. We can see the preparedness of Stephen coming out. I think the wrong response to this message would be to fear sharing the gospel. The wrong response would be fear of sharing the gospel, believing that you can't speak, stand as Stephen did. Two weeks back we heard Peter share and preach about Naman from 2 Kings 5. There was a little girl who played their part. And their part was to point the man to God. She played her part. And I think you should too. So if you missed that sermon, it was a great sermon. Catch it on YouTube and on your audio podcast platform. So that little girl played their part. And I think we too can play our part. We should not fear 
sharing and witnessing to the gospel or try to wait until we know as much as Stephen did. That would be the wrong response. I think there is a great space for being in community. I think there's a great space for spending time and learning more and more about Christ and asking him to help us to be faithful witnesses of himself. Another response might be discouraged. It would be easy to hear this message and be discouraged at the persecution in your life or maybe even lack of persecution if we understand this section. But persecution comes in many ways. It could be from family who don't want to hear you witness of the gospel. Or it could be someone that you've been praying for and desiring to speak the gospel to, but they reject you. We could also be discouraged by our own walk with God. I think this would too be the wrong response. Jesus has died for you. Jesus has died for me. Jesus has died for our sins and he has conquered death. And he wants to be in a relationship with us. He wants to help us witness for him like he does with Stephen. That should break that discouragement. We should not hear this message and be discouraged. But we should be encouraged by the work of Christ. He broke down the temple and he built it again. And he did it for us. There will be another response. It will be easy to hear this message and want to imitate the example of Stephen. Wanting to read the Bible more. To grow in knowledge of God. Wanting to be full of grace and power. This in itself without complete reliance on God would be the wrong response. I want to encourage you to just just leaving here and wanting just to read more or just to be more faithful, if not done, if done with your own strength and done without the complete reliance in God is the wrong response. Stephen relied on God. He trusted and held firm to the promises of God. Him being, him being full of the, of the power of the Holy Spirit means he lived a life of obedience. A life rooted and established in Christ. A life of wisdom. I too have at many times tried to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. To read more the Bible. To pray more. To work out the sin in my life. But it would be the wrong approach. If done by my own strength. I should rather fall at the feet of the Father and ask for forgiveness forgiveness of my sins and ask for him to change me to be more like Christ. To bring people in my life that would point me to Christ and to give me a greater desire to know and be in a relationship with him. I should rather fall at my feet and speak to God. So that he would give me a greater desire to be in a relationship with him. A greater desire to know him more. That would be the right response. So we see very clearly introduction of the gospel through this text. We understand that Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. Jesus Christ through his death becomes the temple giving us direct access to God through to God the Father through him. Jesus Christ through his death becomes our new temple, a new priest, a new sacrifice, a new access to God and fellowship with God. The right response would be to ask for faith, to trust that God is true. For he is true, whether you believe it or not. The right response would be to ask for faith, to trust that the gospel is true, and for him to soften our hearts to believe it. The gospel, which is Jesus Christ dying for our sins once and for all, him rising from the dead, and reigning as the everlasting priest and Lord of glory. He is the sacrifice of sins. He is the go-between us and God. He is our new priest. The right response would be to ask God to make us more like Jesus, more like Stephen, who was more like Jesus. To be filled with the Holy Spirit and to witness for him wherever he has us. The right response would be to ask God to give us faith to trust what he says in his word. To give us faith to know that he is good. To know that he is God. The right response would be to fall at his feet and acknowledge we are broken inside. 
that we surrender and that he can take control of our lives. The right response would be to say that he should show us who he is and fill us. Fill us with his heart and lead us. Let's pray. You may want to speak to God and maybe tell him where you are. You may want to maybe repent or you may want to maybe call upon him to do and continue the work that he started in you. Or you may want to say that I do not know you, Lord, and I seek and desire to know you. Give us a few moments of quiet. Speak to God and tell him where you are. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you did the work of salvation. That you died on the cross for our sins. That you broke down the temple and rebuilt it in three days. We thank you that you did it for us. That you desire to have a relationship with us you desire for us to be yours. We thank you that you empower Stephen, empower the disciples and empower many around us to witness for you. And we thank you that we can pray the same. That you would empower us to be faithful witnesses of you, Lord. We pray that you would give us and grant us a greater desire to know you more and more that when we see the sin in our lives, that we won't want to merely pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, but that we would come to you. That we would bend the knee and fall before you, Father. That we would repent, that we would trust that you would draw us nearer to yourself. That you would remind us that you love us. And that you would remind us that we should also say and practice that we love you because of the work you've done in and through us. Pray that this morning that you'd give us faith to trust your word. Give us faith to trust the things that you say. Give us faith to trust you. Build up our faith in you. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.